Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 11, 2019, and this is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule. I am humbled by your presence today. Thank you so much. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future and a lot can happen between now and then. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously current market conditions. In fact, that's going to pretty much be the focus of the show. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, keep the questions related to the slides just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. And also, at that point in time, if hold off to that point, so we'll make sure we get to them all. But at that point in time, you can begin asking about individual issues. And for your benefit, just ask about one issue at, at a time, put the ticker in, and hit return. That way I can make sure I get to them all. We should have plenty of time to get to everything today. So what are we talking about? Well, I know I've been kind of beat, beating the dead horse on this. And I think last week or two weeks ago, last time we did a show, we did go back to something other than this little market timing thing. We talked about some trading psychology. And I kind of vacillate. I talked a little bit about the markets and market timing and then the systems and setups and things like that. And then I get a little deeper into trading psychology, occasionally some money management. Then we kind of go full circle. But lately we've talked a lot about this 10% system. The reason is I'm still getting a lot of questions on. And there's a few things that I actually overlooked too. And I was thinking as I was going live this morning, it's probably good that I, I got all these questions or received all these questions. It's probably good that there was a buy signal that I completely overlooked. Not that that was good, but the fact that the Facebook group picked up on it and pointed it out to me. So that's one thing to remember with something objective like this. You have to look at it. And just because you think, no, 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 it can't trigger now, maybe it just, maybe it can. So, and I'll flesh that out in just one second. So there's the disclaimer I was looking for. All right, so let's do an update on the 10% TFM system. And let me just go through the rules real quick. We've gone through these at least a dozen times. But essentially, you want to buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. That is a closing high. And the last two weeks, in other words, you have Landry Light, or greater than the 50-week moving average. And then you want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high. And the close is less than the 50-week moving average. The 50-week moving average is just a little bit of a whipsaw filter. And since they slide faster than they glide, what's the old adage? Stocks take the escalator up and elevator down. They go up a lot slower than they go down. We want to make sure we get out of the way as soon as possible to the downside with, of course, the potential of being whipsawed. Well, whipsaws happen like death and taxes. And there's not a whole lot you can do about them, except you have to be extremely careful not to create too many whipsaw filters because what will happen is, as I often say, you could end up getting in really late in a trend. And by the time you finally get in, because all the whipsaw filters kick in, you end up catching the end of the trend and buying that high tick. So you have to be really careful with the whipsaw filters and don't go crazy with them. As I often quote Greg Morris, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So simple, simple, simple little system. And this is just based on the fact that if a market's gonna go from A to C, it has to pass through B along the way. And as long as it is near C, then the market is doing okay, C being a, a new closing high. And you wanna stay long, but if it's dropping from C, possibly going back down to B or even A, then you want to get out of the way. So the little indicator that I have up top is just a, it just looks to see how far away, or it just shows you how far away you are from that 50 week closing high. This is a weekly chart, by the way, and you can always look down here when I'm using these Metastock charts. I use Metastock for a lot of my research and analysis, and then, as you know, I use a Telechart a lot for uh, scanning and I'll also use stock charts and and other companies out there too for various other things. So I use a lot of tools 
in my analysis and my trading. But anyway, before I digress too far, so as long as this market is within 10% of its closing high, that means it's healthy. Also, notice that we have Landry Light in here, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. So you want to stay long when that occurs. And then you want to sell or exit the market when the market is more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high and it closes below the 50-week moving average. So as you'll see with this ribbon, sometimes it goes neutral. Well, neutral means that you might be more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high but you're still above the 50 week moving average. And on the upside, sometimes you might be less than 10% away from the closing high, but you don't have daylight above the moving average. And I'll show you a couple of signals here in just one second. So here's a spreadsheet. I updated it as of this morning. Initially, I didn't think it beat buy and hold, and then I realized that the by entering and exiting the market, your account would grow, and we're investing 100% of the account back into the market. And I just use the S&P cash for this. Now, there's a lot of things that you could sort of noodle with. I didn't factor in dividends and things like that. I just looked at the overall index, and some of that would probably help out buy and hold a bit. The, the goal wasn't to just destroy buy and hold and try to say, oh, this is the greatest system in the world, but more so to avoid the diaper change moments. In other words, those big sell-offs. So beating by and hold is the ultimate goal. Obviously, you want to make more money than someone who is just completely 100% passive. But the more important, more important than beating by and hold is avoiding those diaper change moments. So if you look in here, this is what I call the diaper change moments. I stole that from Ian McActivy. Ian's no longer with us, but Ian was a friend and he, he enjoyed my big blue arrows. He occasionally talked about them in his speeches, so I'm sure he doesn't mind me stealing his diaper change thing. He was hilarious. If you could find any, well, if there's any videos of Ian out there, oh man, his presentations. Uh, I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The first time I saw him, Greg Morris was sitting next to me. And Greg's got this southern kind of draw. He's like, you ever seen this guy before? And I'm like, no. He's like, oh, you're in for a real treat. And he will crack you up. And I think his clients over the years just kind of developed this, this somewhat six sense of humor and would send him all these graphics and he would incorporate them into his presentations. Where he found all this stuff, I have no idea. I guess his clients. But anyway, long story endless. I stole diaper change from him. And diaper change is when you lose a significant amount of money. Remember, a 50% loss requires, what, 100% gain to make up for it. And then it grows even more geometrically from there. So it starts off, let's say you lose 10%. Well, you got to make back 11.1%. Not that big of a deal. But once you start losing 30 and 40%, then it becomes really, really tough. And the other thing, too, and Greg Morris has made this point, and I've made this point, too, and it's a pretty obvious point, that let's say you're getting ready to retire, and you've got a million bucks saved up for retirement, and you lose half of your money. Well, now you have $500,000 saved up, and your lifestyle has completely changed. And as I often preach, it might take 25 years or more for the market to come back. And I've had people laugh in my face when I say that. So I just no longer bother talking about those things at cocktail parties unless they really force me to. Now, the last diaper change moment way back when we exited, or I should say when the system exited, I wasn't trading this system in and of itself just yet. And I'm not trading it in and of itself just yet. I know some of you guys are noodling with it, which is which is awesome, and we'll talk a little bit about that in one second. The last time it exited was on November 23rd, 2018, and it, the market, I should say, the low for the move after that, it got out at, where was the exit on this, 2632, 
And then the market went as low as 23.46. And that was 11% drop. Well, you think, well, that's not that big of a deal, but let's say you had that aforementioned million dollars and you were thinking about retiring. Well, you just lost $110,000 of that million bucks. And that's got to make you a little bit nervous. If it doesn't cause a diaper change moment, it certainly has you thinking about it. Now, you'll see here, after the exit of 2632, there was another buy at 2803. Well, you're getting out 200 points lower, or you're buying, I should say, you're buying 200 and something points or around 200 points higher. Well, that's what trend following is all about. And once you look at the charts, that'll make a little bit more sense. Just real quick, I've talked about this ad nauseum, so I don't want to waste too much time. But you can see it does beat buy and hold, not enough to run out in the streets and get all excited. But more importantly, it avoids these big diaper change moments. And I think that's the, if anything, that's the big deal about this simple little system. And there's plenty of other simple little systems that I'll probably do just as well. So I'm not the grand poobah. This isn't a be all end all. But what's interesting is buy and hold. I went back 30 years and it'd be fun to go back to the start of time. And I'm sure it would do fantastic if you did. Start of the markets, I should say. But you spend about 31 years in the market in buy and hold based on these tests, and then you would have spent 24 and a half years if you were trading the system. So you're out of the market 20% of the time. That's 6.3 years that you have no position other than cash. And, and I think cash as a position is important. Cash as an asset class is important. Nothing wrong with cash. As I have written extensively, cash is not trash. So the last run, last time I updated this, it was only up about 1%, just barely above breaking even based on the last signal. And now with the market breaking out again, hovering around new highs, it's up about 7%. So we don't know what the low of this move will be because it hasn't exited yet. And we don't know what the diaper change will be because it's still long. So it's kind of interesting. And it did go long 132 days ago, which I find quite interesting. And I was going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. But it's the, I'm a, as you know, I'm kind of a nerd with this Facebook group and everything else that I do. But my Facebook mastermind group, you guys were talking about this system being a buy signal. A few months back and I'm like no 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 it's not a buy signal it can't be and lo and behold it was back in March and the reason I think it was a buy be was because I was seeing some negative action in the sectors I wasn't seeing a whole lot of setups to get excited about on the long side and I had all these reasons to be bearish but my own little system here turned bullish and I found that really interesting. And that's one thing we'll flesh out in just one second. It's an objective means of looking at the market. And it's just one tool of many that you can use. Now, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Let's take a look at the last sell signal, the last buy signal. And I also want to explain these indicators a little bit further. So the indicator on the top just tells you how far away you are from 50-week closing highs. So the, the blue indicator up top indicates whether where you are relative to the 50-week closing high. So you can see in this longer-term trend that the market was fairly close or certainly less than 10% away from its all-time highs. Notice when the market begins to drop, the blue line begins to go up because you're getting further and further away from that 50-week closing high. Now, the other thing that I plotted in here is a 50-week moving average, and that is used as our whipsaw filter. A close below it and the market being further, 10% or more, I should say, away from its 50-week closing high will be an exit to lows above the 50-week moving average and being within the 10% of being within 10% of the 50-week closing high would be a long. So let's look at that. Now, one more thing. 
The green line I plotted here is a visual representation of what the blue line is showing from a statistical basis. So you take the highest close. We're not looking at the high. We're not worried about the high. We're just looking at the close. You take the highest close of the last 50 weeks and you subtract 10% from it. And that is your baseline, so to speak. So if you're above that line, then you want to think about getting long. If you're below the line, you want to think about getting short or exiting, I should say, the market. And this is not a, a long short system. This is just a long only system, but it does exit the market on these cells. So anytime the market closes below the green line, you'll notice that the ribbon down here will go to neutral to bearish. Okay. So the last sell signal was here where you close below the green line. And the market at that point was 10.14% away from its 50 week closing high. The ribbon on the bottom turns bearish. It's kind of hard to see. And notice that the market dropped, as I said a few minutes ago, 11% from that signal. It sort of went straight up the next week and then it began to implode in earnest. And again, 11% is not anything to sneeze at. That's a pretty serious drop. So this is the spreadsheet. Remember earlier we showed the 11%, so that's the 11%, and then we had the buy on March 1st. So let's take a look at that buy. You can see we have two weeks, or two bars, because this is a weekly chart, greater than the 50-week moving average. And if we look at the little indicator we have up top, we see that we're only 4.3% away from the 50-week closing high, which would be right there, because the market closed at all-time highs on that date back last September, and we're closing in on that particular high, and the lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. So notice that this little neutral thing here, it's neutral because you may be less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, but you're not or there isn't any daylight above the moving average, okay? So it goes bullish when you have daylight, two weeks of daylight above the 50-week moving average, and you're less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. Let me try it. Let me just draw it in. That was confusing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me see. It's like I, you know, <laughs> I tricked myself up here. Okay, let me tell you how I program this. Let me rewind it all. This down here, this little ribbon, is bullish when two things happen. Number one, look up here. You're less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, okay? So right here, this is a brand new closing high, so obviously you're less than 10% away. Notice this is zero up here. That means you're at a brand new closing high. Now, this green line here is a visual representation of what's up here. So it's 10% below the 50-week closing eye. So, so this minus 10% is going to equal this green line, okay? And notice the green line goes up because we're making brand new closing highs, okay? And when we begin to sell off, Okay, this is our new 50-week closing high. Notice that this begins to increase in here because we're selling off from that 50-week closing high. Now, this is going to stay bullish. Again, as long as we're less than 10% away, you can see we're less than 10% away. This is a 10% line right here, okay? So we're less than 10% away from 50-week closing highs, and we're also above, the lows are above, you have daylight or Landry light above the 50 week moving average. In fact, you need two weeks of Landry light, okay? So when this first turns bullish, this is a buy and it's gonna stay bullish as long as you have two weeks of Landry light above the 50 week moving average, okay? And you're less than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. Now, 
Notice that it came down to kiss the moving average here. So you no longer have the Landry light, but you're still within 10% of the 50 week closing high. So this goes to neutral. So kind of think of it as green light, yellow light, green light, yellow light, red light, yellow light, red light, yellow light, green light, yellow light, okay? So it needs, when it goes neutral, one or two things are happening. It's either intersecting that 50 day moving average or it's greater than 10% away from its 50 week closing high, okay? So if we continue on, with this. Yes, please ask your questions. That would that would actually maybe help me flesh it out. Go ahead, uh, Dathan. So let's do this. Let's just finish this up this slide and then we'll get those questions answered. So here's your buy because you have what? You have two things. One, you have two weeks of Landry light, meaning that you have two lows, one, two, greater than the moving average, okay? And notice here, you're within 4% or actually 4.3% of the 50 week closing high. So the 50 week closing high would be here, right there, the market made all time highs, which is also a 50 week closing high. You subtract 10% from that, which gives you this green line here. And as long as price is above the green line, closing price, and you have two weeks of Landry light, two lows greater than the moving average, then you're in buy mode, okay? Now, notice that it goes bullish here, that means a buy. And then it immediately goes to neutral. Well, it went to neutral. Why? Well, because the low dipped below the 50 week moving average. You're still fairly close to 50 week closing highs. Okay. You're a little further away because you had a little bit of a dip. Notice that the blue line goes up a little bit. It's probably like 5% at this point in time, just kind of eyeballing it. But you intersected the moving average. So the ribbon down here goes neutral. And then it goes bullish again once you have two weeks of daylight and you're within 10% of the 50 week closing high. Now, one more thing before we get to the questions. Notice that the line in this really simple, and, and it's interesting how something so simple can get somewhat complex at times. But notice this this is your 50 week closing high. So take that times point. 9.0, okay, or subtract 10%, however you want to look at it, and draw a line, and that's going to be down here. Now, notice this line stays flat for a long, 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 long time, but then notice right here it begins to go up, okay? Well, the reason it goes up is because right here you start to make a brand new closing high, multiply that times 0 0.90. Obviously, this number is going to be bigger than this number, so this is going to start to climb, okay? And you make another new high here, so this is going to continue to climb higher, but then the market begins to sell off. Well, it's not going to change until this catches up. So this is going to remain the 50-week closing high. If it's not making new highs, it's going to take at least 50 weeks before this will be the 50-week closing high, okay? So as you'll see in the longer term charts, that green line will eventually catch up the price. If you have a big, huge spike bottom, kind of like we had recently, the green line doesn't catch up. It doesn't have time to catch up. But let's just say that last December, the market meandered for a long time and then slowly crawled lower or worked its way lower, then eventually that green line will begin to catch up with price. I want to show you the longer term charts it'll make a lot more sense, okay? So the question is, the last Landry light is a two weeks above the 50 week line. How's that a buy? And he said, sorry, never mind. Forget it's a weekly chart, and ignore, okay. Yeah, if you, as I said a second ago, when I'm in Metastock, notice, it, notice if it has weekly down here, I'm sorry, it has W. When I'm in Telechart, it'll, have, it'll say weekly up here, W-E-E. K L Y. Okay. So yes, this is a weekly chart and this is a 50 week moving average right here. Okay. So that was your last buy signal. Now, as I was saying earlier, you're selling here and then you're buying here. Okay. Well, you're buying much higher than you recently sold out, but that's okay. 
That's trend following, okay? Trend following, you must first have a trend to follow. So you have to wait for that trend to establish itself. And, and what's our trend filter? Less than 10% away from 50 week closing high, two lows greater than 50 week moving average. That's the whole thing, okay? That's not the beauty of the system is like getting in higher than you sold. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but avoiding a slide like this makes a heck of a lot of sense, okay? Because there's no guarantee that that thing wasn't gonna go, that thing being the market, that there's no guarantee that it's gonna stop at 10% or 11% or 12% or 30% or 40% or 50%. If you, again, I know I say this quite often, but NASDAQ seemed pretty cheap in 2000 when it was down 50%, but then it dropped another 30% from there. And peak to trough, it ended up down 70 something percent. And that's a pretty serious slide, obviously. So again, I still get a lot of questions on this and you know, keep them coming because it helps me to flesh it out further and make sure that I fully understand it. So I actually received a few of these. Dave, I'm confused. Do you only buy stocks when you have a 10% buy signal? And the answer is no. It's simply a tool, one of many. So I took a slide from a few weeks back, or I left the slide in from a few weeks back, which kind of breaks it down a little bit. I'm just gonna go through this real quick because we've done this before. But first, again, it's just another tool. It's a puzzle piece. But I do think it could be the start of something bigger. Like I said a few weeks back, Jim from my Facebook group is working on a lot of market timing stuff and he's doing some stuff with his IRAs and his 401ks and stuff like that. And I've got quite a few people who are very interested in fleshing this stuff out further. So if you're a member of Dave Landry Trend Traders, or I should say, if you're a gold member, then join Dave Landry Trend Traders, which is my mastermind group on Facebook. And uh, you have to be a gold member, and that's to keep the riffraff out. And so far, it's been a godsend. It's been great. I've I've received... So, uh, well, first of all, like I said a few minutes ago, I didn't realize I even had a buy signal in this system that I created until one of you guys, I think it might have been one of your girls, might have been Linda pointed out how we had a buy. And then now we're talking about market timing and a lot of IPOs come up and I've done fairly well on quite a few stocks that you guys have brought up in a group. So thank you very much, guys and girls. Now, if you're under a buy, okay, if the ribbon is bullish, then you want to focus on the long side. I suppose if it's neutral, then you want to be a little skeptical. If you're under a sell signal, then you want to be very selective on the long side and possibly consider shorting. Now, again, it's just a piece of the puzzle. It's not like you go crazy bullish or crazy bearish when one of these things happen. <laughs> crazy bullish. <laughs> Story has nothing to do with the markets. My I remember a while back, my wife called the Chinese place. We lived out in the country before we moved to this rental while we're building our new house. And the China place, if they weren't busy, would deliver like out to the middle of nowhere where we live. But if they were busy, was they would say, no, they can't do it. And my wife said, uh, are you guys crazy busy? No, we not crazy busy. We China garden. <laughs> anyway, so don't go crazy bullish. Don't go crazy bearish. But do use it as one particular, as a particular piece of the puzzle. So when this thing turned bullish back in March, even though I was kind of crazy bearish back then, it won't be up to the fact that, well, wait a minute, Dave, the market might be improving. And it's an objective tool. I'm not a huge fan of mechanical trading, but an objective tool like this can help you out. And I've kind of toyed with the idea of maybe allocating some funds just to market timing and do the market timing with this. So the designer's intent, again, is for the overall market. A lot of people want to apply it to individual stocks. I think you'd be better off with the core methodology for that. And in IPOs, you'd be better off with my favorite pioneer patterns, such as the buy at B and the Landry like five day SMA system. But you know, feel free to do whatever you want. Take the ball and run with it. Like I've said before, I've had people take my research in one case in particular, but there's been a few where somebody took my stuff and applied it to micro cap stocks 
and ended up doing really, really, really well. Now, this was back in the rip roaring bull market, so everything was working back then. Don't know if it worked that well today. But like I've said before, it's like somebody stole your bike off your front porch, rode around a block, and when they got in front of your house, again, they popped a wheelie, you know, showing off. <laughs> anyway, so keep in mind that 10% is based on the general overall market volatility versus the S&P. Now, we're going to look at the Russell in a few minutes, and I haven't gotten around to determining whether 10% was good or not for that. It's probably, good, probably okay, uh, just from the surface. If you wanted to take it and apply it to the Russell and do a little bit extra work on that, I would strongly urge you to do that. If I could encourage you to do anything like that, that would excite me and hopefully benefit you. Now, for other markets, it might be higher or lower depending on the volatility of that market. And I think the volatility would be so extreme in certain markets that it, it just wouldn't work. But for the overall market, you want to get out the way when the market drops 10% or more and it closes below its 50-week moving average. Now, for individual stocks, again, use the core methodology and use the 10%. TFM system as a piece of your analysis. So back in March, this thing triggered. It's been a long signal for, I think, 110 days, if I memory serves, somewhere around 100 days at least. So it kind of woke me up to the fact that maybe the market is improving. Maybe I shouldn't short too many stocks. Maybe I should consider some longs here and there. And we've had a few buys since this same thing triggered in some individual issues. Okay, the name is, the question is, do you think this can be applied to sectors and or industries? I guess the quick answer is yes, but the caveat would be, as I just said, the question came in before the slide, so FYI, I just want to get through the slide first. But yeah, you might have to have a little bit bigger than 10%, okay? Because we're using 10% based on the overall general market volatility. And as I said a minute ago, I think 10% is a pretty serious slide. If a market drops 10%, you might need to begin to worry if it's going to drop more than 10%. If the semiconductor index, let me rewind that. If the semiconductor index drops 10%, that might be a little cause for concern, but it's it's pretty volatile, so that you might not want to freak out just yet. Okay, you might not want to exit. Just yet. So you'll have to do a little of that work yourself if you want to experiment with that. And as time allows, I'll begin to mess around with it too. Maybe I can program in the indicator for telechart. Uh, if somebody wants to do that and give it to me, that'd be awesome. Uh, save me 20 minutes of uh, programming. And I'll be happy to plot it in, in different markets and noodle around with it. There's just not enough time to do everything. I have so many ideas and so many things to do. I'll never get around to doing everything. But yeah, absolutely. If you want to mess around with that, please do. And again, you'll probably have to adjust your parameters a little bit. But it depends on the sector. In a lot of sectors, it might work out fairly nicely. Probably depends on the beta of the sector as it relates to the overall market or, or put more simply, volatility of the market. So the point is, this is just one little thing. And like weekly bow ties, the 50-day... SMA, Landry Light, and even the 50-week SMA in and of itself, the 10% system shows promise to help keep you on the right side of the market. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but to avoid some diaper change moments, to help you avoid those diaper change moments. Now, the reason that I've done so much work with the 50-day simple moving average in more recent years is that, or 50-week simple moving average, is because I often talk about people who give these presentations and they have 50 different indicators and they show the little system, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. And if you look at the overall trend and, and usually nine out of 10 times or nine out of 100 times, if they're using all these complex indicators, they will have a moving average in the chart. Simply looking at that moving average and staying long above it or short below it would eliminate most of their signals and probably perform a hell of a lot better, especially if you were to factor in slippage and commissions. So taking a dose of my own medicine, I'm a big, huge fan of the weekly bow tie buy and sell signals, which we'll look at in just one second. 
but I've actually taken a dose of my own medicine and, and looked at, well, what would a 50 week moving average do in and of itself? And it works pretty damn good. In other words, you could simplify some things further or use it as a confirming signal. So if we go back in to the 10% TFM system, so remember the green line is where 10% would be, okay? And then the blue area looks like an area chart now since it's squished up, will tell you how many percent you are away. So a couple things, notice that if you just stayed long when it's bullish, okay? And it stayed short when it's bearish, you would probably do pretty good. As long as you're above the green line, for the most part, as you were back here, stay long. As long as you're below the green line, stay short, okay? And then long, and then short. And then you had a few little whipsaws in here, but for the most part, stayed long for a long, long time. A couple little exits and whipsaws. No big whoop. I think it was, what, 10 trades in 30 years? That's not, I don't consider that a tremendous amount of whipsaw. A couple of gleamings here. Notice that once you get 50 days, so notice this stayed fairly flat. Okay, the market was kind of almost a brand new highs here, so you, it's hard to see. You have to kind of squint your eyes. It did go down a little bit. But then as the market begins to drop, the 50-day high begins to drop. Okay, so this green line starts to slowly catch up with price. Now, if you have a big spike bottom like we had here, and a few other places, especially going back to that 2018 sell signal that we had, the green line's not gonna catch up because the high remains the high for at least 50 weeks. And we didn't get 50, we didn't have 50 weeks of trading then. But it was kind of cool back at the 2002, 2003 bottom, where a market takes a while to bottom out, then that green line will drop accordingly and you'll get long a lot sooner okay because it'll catch up to price okay so again if it's green you want to stay mostly long and you can get a little cautious in between when it gets neutral that's okay but as long as it's green you want to stay long when it turns red like it did back in 2008 you want to be short and then it turns green, you want to get long. I'm sorry, I said short. You want to be out of the market, but you might want to short some individual issues. All right, that's it says, I like this system. I've got a shill in here. <laughs> it's a great tool to keep you on the right side of the market with my individual trades, helps to calm down the noise. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have, and I don't know if I have it programmed in correctly, but I have this programmed to think or swear, and I have been looking at just to see what would happen with with uh, individual issues. And I haven't really figured out how to use it just yet there, but for the overall market, it does a really good job. And again, back here, it's kind of hard to see, but back here in March or wherever, over here, I was still a little bearish, but the system turned positive. And that's kind of a bit of a wake up call. Hey, maybe things are improving. I had a girlfriend that was crazy bullish. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Was she crazy bullish? 2015 and 16 would have been hard to handle with this system. Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I hear you. We had, this is, and I've kind of beat the dead horse on 2015, 2016. This is 2015, 2016. It would have gotten you out. And yeah, there would have been some whipsaw in there. We can go back and look at that spreadsheet if we have time, but that's okay. I mean, you will have some whipsaw along the way. And let's see when it actually triggered. We'll have to go back and look at that. In fact, let's, we'll do that real quick, but let's just finish the slide up. But remember, 2050, 2060 was a pretty serious slide in the market. And the buy and hold people just held right through it, right? Buy and hold. And they turned out looking like freaking geniuses. Well, this is where Judd, let me say it, what's his name? Dotary. I don't know if that's exact his exact name, but he's basically said that 
any fund manager who has kept up with the market should be questioned over that last bull run because they have likely not taken any evasive action when the market sold off hard. So 2015, 2016, let's just see what happened. You would have gotten out. Yeah, there was only one sell. It was in 2016, and it didn't buy back until, until April. So you got out in January of 2016. Let me make a note of that. And when we get to the live charts, we'll have a look. The exit was 115, 2016. And then you got back in when? 4 8, 2016. Now we had other signals that did occur back then too. Okay, so this is where we were. Again, green above the green line. And bullish down here stay mostly long and you can see you've had some pretty darn good runs okay don't exit on the neutral following this one particular system now there might be other reasons to get out but following this one particular system in and of itself don't exit on the neutral once you get a buy okay only exit when you get a sell so you stayed bullish you would got long 2012 You'd had one little, you got to squint your eyes right there, though. There's your sell signal. You had one sell in what? Four years. You'd stay long four years and have one sell. And then you would have gotten back in fairly soon, 2016. And then you would have stayed long for about three years. And then you would have had one sell. And now you're long again. And hopefully this thing stays long for the next five, 10, 15 years. Okay? I don't. I'm okay being a bull. It's a lot easier to make money in a bull market. And my clients, for the most part, don't short, although I seem to be getting a higher level of client now, and that's my ultimate goal, is to get everybody through the learning management system so we could all be on the same page, and I don't have to stop and go back to square one every time I feel like I'm getting somewhere, moving higher and higher as far as the market knowledge is concerned. Let everybody get, to, get up to speed first, and then we could all help each other. All right, so some other simplified market timing. I've talked about this quite a bit. This is just simply the Landry light above and below the 50-week moving average. That's all it is. And you can see that as long as it's green, especially if it stays green for a while, you want to be long, okay? And notice that it stayed green from here all the way to here. And that was what? 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998. You'd have a little bit of red here, okay? That might have knocked you out, but that's okay. You get back in, 1999, and what do you get out again? In 2000. So 1999, 2000, about a couple of years here, stay green, turns red again. Well, what happened? Big old fat bear market, okay? Turns green, stays green for a long, long time. Couple little Tiny little bitty reds in here, okay? Now, if it stays red for a while, you might need to think about getting out. But as long as it's green or doesn't stay red too much, you want to stay in the market. Well, what happened in 2007? This is the big thing. Everybody's like, I didn't, you know, I didn't see 2008 coming. And everybody, you know, 20 years later, it was it 10 years later, everybody in their brother's explaining it and saying, oh, oh, yeah, they saw it coming. But a lot of people didn't see it coming. Like, it's this huge surprise. All these documentaries still coming out about 2007, or 2008, I should say. Well, we started seeing this thing turn red at the end of when? 2007. And then it stayed, then it was red for a while in 2008. Well, after it's red for a while, you might want to think about getting out of the market. And, of course, you might want to look at these other signals, too. But, again, you can see the green... You're above the moving average, stays green. The lows, I should say, Landry light above, Landry light below, meaning the highs or less than the moving average, it turns red as it has here. Lows are greater than the moving average, turns green, stay green for how long? Look at that, okay? One, two, three, three and a half years. 
Well, that's one hell of a run. Okay? That looks pretty damn good to me. Started turning red and went 2050, 2060. Well, this didn't turn into the mother of all bear markets, but the Russell, I think as I've said ad nauseum, lost 18% of its value from one of these signals from the Landry light system, I think. So, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the TFM 10% system and weekly bow ties. So nothing to sneeze at there. It's okay. He who fights and runs away, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Look at that. One year, two year, okay? Two and a half, almost three years of a nice little run higher. I mean, I'm a nerd, but this gets me excited. It makes me feel pretty good about using something really simple to help keep me on the right side of the market. Now, keep in mind that just in case you're new to these presentations, this indicator up top does not measure any kind of magnitude. That little blue line we had, the little 10% blue line, that did measure magnitude. That measured how far away we are from the 50-week moving average. This green up here just counts the number of days. So here's 100, which seems to be a good little area to watch. This market stayed above its 50-week moving average for 100 plus weeks. And it just seems like when it starts getting around 100 or so, the market is due for a correction, okay? I wouldn't try to time the market on that, but if unless you're seeing fantastic new setups, I would be skeptical in putting on new positions. I would certainly make sure you're taking profits along the way on existing positions when they're hitting the initial profit target and don't hold on full positions thinking that this time it's different, okay? So anyway, this measures just the number of days and notice that it goes down to zero as soon as the market intersects that moving average. Neat stuff, if I say so myself. Now, as you've seen me preach before, if you have a major weekly bow tie coming off an all-time high or a multi-year low in the markets, such as we had in 2007, market makes all-time highs, the 10-day moving average, 10-day simple is greater than a 20-day exponential, which is also greater than 30-day exponential, 10 is greater than 20, greater than 30, means you're still in an uptrend trend according to moving averages, but when they flip over, over a fairly short period of time, then you have to wonder if the trend may be turning, and then the setup would be a higher low and a high, and a low I'm sorry a higher high and a higher low in some cases you just get a higher low and that's the whole system right there so that was 2007 it also triggered it triggered early in 2008 it also triggered in early 2000 so I showed this chart so many times people say can you stop showing that chart but I'm sorry I'm a nerd notice that 2000 ESL 2008 right around January you had a sell, and in 2015 you had a sell. Now, indeed, it really didn't sell off hard in 2015. Well, so what? It, it sold off hard enough to create a diaper change type of moment. Now, we did have a sell quite recently, but it never triggered. And then, of course, in 2003, that was a really good signal because the bow ties caught up to the market because the market bottomed out for a couple of years. And then the one in 2009 was a little late to catch up, but we did have a lot of daily signals triggering and a lot of other things that were working. This, this like anything else, is just another tool. Now, just real quick, and this is left over from a few weeks back, during the last market sell-off back in May, or at least when I grabbed this chart, there was an hourly bow tie down. The problem with watching intraday charts, especially like a five minute chart, like I talked about in yesterday's Q and A, is that you can end up chasing your own tail because the moves look a lot bigger than they really are. But an hourly chart, I think is useful because the market will turn on an hourly chart first. So I wouldn't rush out and get crazy bearish when this occurs, but you certainly want to have your little antenna go up. And hopefully, and again, I'm, I've, I've grown, I, I am somewhat of an egotistical type of person, but I've become less egotistical, especially since I started this Facebook group, because it made me realize that 
there's a lot that I might not be seeing and that you guys and girls are helping me to see in the markets. We're actually helping each other. So if one of you guys or girls sees a weekly, I know Jim keeps an eye on these things for us, but anybody else, just in case Jim uh, gets hit by a beer truck, let us know. If you see a weekly bow tie down off the spiders or whatever other chart, I'm sorry, if you see an hourly bow tie down after the market makes new highs, so like right now would be the time to start watching for those hourly bow ties, patterns of fractal. Okay, any questions on all the market timing? I know, as usual, I get myself confused, but it's really quite simple. I think by accident we over complicated. The question is, where's winter? Well, that bastard John Snow has been talking about winter for a while. Well, we might not have to worry about winter just yet, because as I speak, the NASDAQ's at brand new highs, the S&P 500, I think is around new highs. We'll take a look at that in just one second. Now, what's kind of interesting is the Russell 2000 has not triggered a buy signal just yet. And the last sell signal we had, if you were using the 10% rule in the Russell 2000, the Russell dropped 18% from the sell signal. So I think 18% is enough to qualify as a possible diaper change moment. Now, even though the market has snapped back, what's our whipsaw filter? Well, there's two. On the downside, it must close below the 50-week moving average, and it must be more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. On the upside, it must close within 10%, and here we go. This would be the all-time high for the Rusty right here. So this would be 10% away from that high. So anything above this, you're within 10% of that high. Anything below that, you're more than 10% away from that high. Now, let's take a look at the moving average. Well, I'll filter for the upside is one bar, two bars above the moving average. And notice that we haven't had one day of daylight yet on the Russell 2000, okay? So the Rusty is neutral. Yes, it's neutral after a sell. So you had a sell signal back here, and now it's going neutral. So the ribbon, I forgot to put it in this chart, but the ribbon all the way up to right here would be red, and then now we're neutral, okay? The big thing about the Russell that concerns me is so far, it just looks like a big picture retrace rally, okay? Market sold off, retraced up. And unless we get past, let's say, 161 and change, or, or higher, I should say, I remain concerned about the Russell 2000. So there's always something to worry about. In this particular case, the Rusty is not joining in the party just yet so that's that's a little bit concerning but certainly not the end of the world will it eventually catch up to the peace if everything else continues to to improve probably all right if you are a member a gold member of davelandry.com join the facebook group i've had one or two of you guys say that you don't do facebook well just create an alias and let me know what your alias is and I'll let you in. You don't have to be, you don't have to participate yourself. I created the page years ago for my dog <laughs> and it made people nuts and it pissed a lot of people off because all I would do is I, I, as I log it as my dog and no matter what they wrote, I would reply with rough. <laughs> It's, I think that's uh, South Park did something like that. Like if you wanted to be like South Park doesn't allow real celebrities on the show. So except for they made one exception. I think George Clooney came in as a turkey and he just he made gobble noises. He didn't actually use his voice. Anyway, I need to see if that account's still out there and start. The dog's actually dead now. <laughs> so I guess I could do a do one. Anyway, make sure you join the Facebook group. It's up top. I will approve you. You do have to put in your email so we can uh, do a cross-reference on you, and that keeps the riffraff out. 
anyway, lots of good stuff in the Facebook group. I've picked up quite a few stocks, specifically IPOs, and I've, threw out, I've thrown out a few that have worked out okay. A couple of them failed miserably here and there, but we've overall, I think we've done pretty good. So again, if you want to be, if you really, really are serious, because I get a lot of questions from people, and I've gotten questions from years and years and years, sometimes from the same people, and I'm wondering, do they really want to be serious about their trading, or they just want to dabble here and there? And trading is something you want to be really serious about. So I would say, come in here, take all the members' courses, and then if there's anything missing, just email me. No, I'm sorry, submit it through the system, so it goes through the system. Go to the members dashboard and submit the questions right here and then we'll cover them in the bi-weekly Q&A sessions. All right, let's hop in to the overall market. And the first thing we wanted to do was, we wanted to take a look and see if the, let me get this set up. We wanted to take a look and see where those sell signals were. So 2015, 2016, thank you. Okay, let's take a look at that. All right, so the sell signal was, again, 115-2016. So you actually didn't get a sell signal here. And let me just take a quick measurement. Let's just see where we were. It's not going to be high to low, but we'll close enough. Yeah, so you were, let's just say, 7.5%. It wasn't quite 10%, but it was a get ready to get ready way back here, 2014. The actual sell signal was on 4-8-2016. So we didn't get another one here until, does that make sense? We're going to have to look at this, maybe not live one day. Or was that a buyback? That was a buyback, 115-2016. Okay, yeah, so you did get a whipsaw back here. And again, Telechart doesn't, uses a rolling date. So somewhere in here you sold and then the market went after a little bit of a drop, went pretty much straight back up. So yeah, that was a whipsaw in 2016. There was only one sell signal though. In spite of all this market selling off, there was only one sell signal and that was on 115, 2016, which would have been somewhere around here. And then where was the buy? The buy was 4A 2016, which would have been somewhere around here, I think on that week there, somewhere in here. So you'd have gotten long there. And then what did the market do? You stayed long, stayed long, stayed long, stayed long, stayed long. So you could see, even though you had a one little whipsaw, it did take off nicely since. And then we had a little, somewhat of a whipsaw recently. Anyway, hopefully that made some sense. Sorry about screwing up. Let's take a look at current conditions. And then if you guys want to start asking about and girls individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we're at all-time highs. That's a good thing. As a trend follower, I'm not going to argue with that. Ideally, I'd like to see this market bust out past these prior little peaks in here and not look back for a while. So far, so good. It's summertime. That always gets me a little nervous in the summer because markets can get a little choppy. But as long as we're banging on new highs, I'm not going to get too excited. So we're starting to look pretty good in here. Now, a couple of big down days will put us back into the soup. So a little too early to start kissing each other just yet, but it's certainly looking pretty good. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, at least five minutes ago, was banging out brand new highs. If we were to close here, we would close at all-time highs. Keep in mind, let's see if we can do it backwards. Keep in mind that if it dropped a percent or two, we would be right back into the soup. And I used to consult with the hedge fund. He called it the soup. The soup is when you just back it to the, the range. Once you break out of the range, decisively you stay above it, and the market's trending, you're in a trend. If you drop back into the range, you're back to wait and see mode. So, that's what I mean by the soup. Russell 2000, again, on a weekly basis, is a big picture weekly retrace look to it. As Stafford just pointed out, it's still in neutral as far as the buy signal goes. But we are less than, and I'll just grab one of these days in here. 
we're barely, but we're less than 10% away from 50 week closing highs. Some of these areas in here, like the drugs, are wide and loose and all over the place. They didn't get the memo about breaking out. But some other areas, like retail, looking pretty good, bat blasting out to new highs, software blasting out to new highs. The semiconductors remain a bit of a disappointment in here. You can see they're up a smidge today. So far, they just look like a big picture retrace. So not everything is great in the world. But as a general statement, with the S&P at brand new highs and NASDAQ at, at brand new highs, a lot of the sectors are starting to join in the fray and look pretty good. All right, OSTK on a pullback. All right, let's take a look at this. Maybe. So it's come down. It's bottomed out. It's got a little bit. I think it's got too much overhead supply for me to get that excited about it. I guess if it got all the way to this overhead supply, that would be good. But then you have a little bit here. And then you have a little bit here to overcome. So just, just too many bad memories along the way. If this chart was six months out and bottoming out and just beginning to turn a corner, I'd get a little bit more excited about it. But too many bad memories on that one. But I hear you, though. I mean, it's had a nice run higher. And, it, yeah, swing trade for sure. But I don't like to take any stocks – unless they have the potential to turn in much longer term trades other than a swing trade. All right, Zach saying base breakout on, yeah, good eye on that one. A little bit on the thin side, 16, uh, 160,000 shares. Uh, who was it in the group? John from the group, John Z, I think, calls these thin stocks, Hotel California stocks, Linda Rasky's book, Trading Sardines. Excellent book, by the way. Said, uh, they always let you in, they never let you out. John and the group, it's like a Hotel California stock. You can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. So be careful with that. But yeah, if this pulls back a little bit further, um, Zach, I know you've gone after a lot of these stocks at super high levels. My only concern with some of these is that, especially if they're a little bit thicker than this, but not so much with this one, but some of those other ones we talked about, is that they might be priced for perfection. Ideally, you want to try to find something that, that might not be as extended. But yeah, a little bit more of a pullback. We'll take a look at it. The It, it is a little wide and loose, somewhat longer term, as you can see. But it's definitely a not bad, okay? E Ego is my favorite pick, but I missed an early entry. Take it on a pullback. Well, why did you miss it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a gold stock. I've been looking at the golds. I haven't found any place to get on them yet. I'm a little bit more lenient with setups when it comes to golds. But yeah, if this thing pulls back, next time it pulls back, uh, to me, I didn't really see a point where it pulled back or I could have gotten on. Remember, if you settle upon a methodology, as you should, then a lot of times you're not going to be able to kiss all the women. It's not going to always set up perfectly for everything. So for me, I wouldn't have had a setup anywhere in here. So I just have to be willing to let it go and not get too excited, okay? No, I wouldn't take another entry on that until you had another setup. ADVM on a pullback. Why do I know this stock? Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, my big concern when you have a stock that has this huge wide range bar up, I would actually prefer that to be a little smaller or like back here is with a couple of bars. We'll just have to, it, it'll be, we'll know when we see it. Let's see what it looks like on a pullback. The other thing to consider too is it's, it's had quite the run. What's that about? 600%? 400%. 400 percent run. That's pretty substantial. Pretty extended. The last run was really one bar pretty much. I think I would pass on that one. It's, it's just gotten a little too crazy. CSU triggering today. Here's the thing. I'm not seeing any setups right now. One particular short, possible short, short, excuse me. But other than that, not a whole lot. This one has a lot of bad memories to it, okay? So just a big wad of overhead supply. And I don't like this big gap down way back here. So, yeah, it might push higher, but it's going to have its work cut out for it. So, no, it wouldn't. I wouldn't see it as triggering today. It kind of shot up and came in and really didn't get past this prior little peak in here. So, 
I have a lot of trouble with that one. Rad. Well, this has a little bit of a Phoenix characteristic to it. Um, I would prefer if it had bottomed out for much, much, much longer. I hear you. It looks like it's bottoming out. Let's just wait for a setup and see. Most of the rallies is one big day, and then it's just kind of like crawled up to its prior little hide here. So I'd actually like to see a little bit more push higher before getting too excited about that one. And then it does have a little overhead supply here and there. So we'll have to come back to that one, but not, not yet. Pays on a pullback. That one's going to be one that's really extended. And one thing I've talked about a lot lately is price for perfection. It's had a, what, 2 million percent run? 3,000 percent run, okay? And it's got quite a bit of volume. There's probably a lot of portfolio managers now own this stock. There's probably a lot of people now own this stock. The whole world knows about this stock now. So it's sort of priced for perfection. Who's left to buy? Not that you want to confuse the issue with facts, but if they stumble a little bit on their earnings, meaning they only make 100% earnings instead of 101% earnings, and everybody was hoping they made at least 90% earnings, they have to blow out their earnings so much, they're just going to be put under a microscope. I'd almost prefer to short a stock like this, not yet, but soon. And I guess I could show you one because it's no longer official setup on the service. But this is a stock that could be priced for perfection and now could actually be a shorting opportunity, PLNT, okay, Planet Fitness. And you can see it made kind of a double top in here, but it's had such a tremendous run. I think that if this stock doesn't do absolutely spectacular on earnings and everything, it could tumble fast, okay? So that's the problem with those stocks that are in a super duper duper long term uptrends. VSLR. This one really didn't break out that much. Okay. So I would have preferred to see or I'd prefer to see a bigger breakout followed by a pullback as opposed to a mediocre breakout followed by a pullback all the way to pretty much where it broke out from. So yeah, put that on your momentum list by all means, but I would not go after it right away. APTO, too many recent bad memories. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, I mean, I, I prefer these stocks. It ran up, it came back down. I mean, it doesn't have a boatload of overhead supply, but it does have some, and it's kind of all over the place. I prefer something that, yes, would have a little bit better clear air. So yeah, you, you answer your own question on that one. CMRX buy or did it pull back too far? CMRX. Keep in mind, I'm not like Mikey hating everything, okay? It's just that there's not a whole lot out there because the methodology requires a pullback and the market's at brand new highs, at least the P's in the NASDAQ. First thing I see here is a big old fat gap down, so this stock does have some bad memories. And yes, you answered your own question on this one too. You have a shit ton of overhead supply. Did I just demonetize my video? Damn it. I'll have to edit that out. You have an S ton of overhead supply. Yeah, we'll do the PG-30. I want to make sure that the, the, <laughs> the guys who buy up million dollars of advertisement, millions of dollars of advertisement, even though they're full of bull, I like to make a little money off of those, uh, those guys, the guys at the beginning of the video. Um, looks like these solos are waking up, huh? Yeah, maybe on a pullback. I mean, obviously it's got some issues long, long, long term, but that's so far back. I mean, I don't know. Markets have bad memories. This big old gap back here. I'm going to give that a strong maybe. But yeah, it's, it's going to have to pull back, of course, a little bit more deeply. You know, I'd prefer if this wide range bar was kind of like in the middle of the trend as opposed to the beginning of the breakout. But let's see what it looks like when it pulls back. Yeah. E-I-D-X. Yeah, a little bit on the thin side. You could put this on your momentum list. A little extended, though. Let's see what it looks like on a pullback. But, yeah, that's possible. I definitely would put that on your momentum list. But it is a little thin, okay? We think about H-E-I as an ogre. No, it's not, it's not a big enough. Zach, we talked about these yesterday. I don't think the gap was big enough. I mean, it's okay. I, I, you know, I can't beat you up on that. I guess I'm beating you up too much on that. But uh, 
I prefer a bigger gap, but good eye, okay, good eye. But let's see, how big is that gap? Is there a way to measure that easily? Not really. It's probably only like 2%. Yeah, it's only like a 2% gap. Do this, Zach, you got a calculator? Do 136, 136 minus 133 divided by 136. I'll do it for you. That's why it's three, three divided by 136. You know, that's like a 2% gap. Eh, I'd like to see something bigger. I mean, it's not horrible, don't get me wrong, but I'd like to see a little bit bigger gap. I mean, if you're going to play an opening gap reversal, it needs to be a pretty serious gap. But that's that's not bad. That's not horrible. I mean, good eye. You know, I don't want to beat you up too much on that. ZB. Can I tell him how you are, Zach? Zach's going to be running a hedge fund before we know it. I'm not a huge fan of shippers, so they really have to knock my socks off. If you go way back in time, it's like I prefer something like a shipper. Let me just see what else is in shipping. Let's just take a quick stroll down shipping lane and see. Let's see if we can find something at low levels. Yeah, something like this T and K. Notice that it came down and bottomed out forever. It's wide and loose. But something like this that bottomed out, I'd be more excited about. Like this one here, maybe, if it ever got its act together. I like them when they're at major, major, major lows. As a lot of these are. Oh, look at this crap, piece of crap. <laughs> Chippers could be really, really choppy. And volatile, as you know. Yeah, now those few up here that were at major lows, I'd watch those for opportunities more than this SB. PAYX, look out below, PAYX. Yeah, here's another example, okay? Look, huge volume, okay? That sounded like I haven't watched South Park in years. I did watch an episode the other day, so I'm lying, but. Okay, um, little low on HV, but, you know, look out below. Yeah, that's an example of something that could be great eye on that, by the way, Dathan. But, yeah, there's something that could be a lot of trouble, something that could be priced for perfection. Every fund in the world probably owns it. Volatility is a little low, but if you're shorting, you don't want to be shorting high volatility. Or be darn careful if you do. So, yeah, that has potential. All right, any any unanswered questions? Any other stocks? Well, an impasse. I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time, again, out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, submit it through the Q&A, and I will either take care of it in next week's Week in Charts. It requires a lot of thoughts. I will obviously go I'll cover to the Q&A and... Maybe I'll be nice enough to give you a sneak peek if you're not already a member. But if you're not a member, what are you waiting on? It's 47 bucks <laughs> to get started. All right, everybody, enjoy the weekend, and I'll see you guys again, hey, girls, hopefully next week. Thank you so much. Y'all welcome.